name is Peter Keisler, and on behalf of the Federalist Society, thank you. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I'd like to welcome all of you here to tonight's banquet. Uh, this weekend, we're going to try to do what the Federalist Society always does, which is to bring together prominent members of the bar, of academia, and of the bench to address important issues and to make remarks that can be used against them at subsequent confirmation hearings. <laughs> In that regard, we'd like to extend a special wel welcome to Frank Easterbrook and Edith Jones. <laughs> We're delighted to have you here, and we hope you'll make full use of this opportunity. To introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to present David McIntosh. David is one of the original founders of this organization, both a founder of the University of Chicago chapter and of the National Federalist Society. He's been a member of the board since its beginning. He's national co-chairman, and he currently serves as the assistant to the vice president for domestic policy. David. Thank you very much, Peter. Our guest speaker tonight has told me that he, he needs to be in a bed and fairly early, so I'm going to shorten my introduction in the interest of letting you hear somebody who actually has something to say. Our guest tonight is a man who over the years has contributed a great deal to the Federalist Society, as well as to the ideals for which the Society stands. Like the Federalist Society, he has always championed the view that ideas are what matter in public life, and lively debate about those ideas are the best signs of a healthy democracy. In Washington, this attitude, that intellectual controversy has to be sought after rather than shunned, was tantamount to heresy. But it was hardly a surprising one, coming from a man who played in a rock and roll band called Plato and the Guardians, <laughs> or in another band called Graham and the Crackers. But he is not only a musician, he's a trained professor of philosophy, taught at the Boston University, University of Mississippi, and the National Humanities Center in North Carolina. We're all familiar with his record here in Washington as chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Secretary of Education, and in the Bush administration as director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. It's fitting that he should be our guest tonight because few people in American public life has so strongly defended the idea of individual responsibility and have so strongly rejected the notion that the victim is not the victim mentality that underpins many of our present social programs. Our guest may have made one or two enemies in the process of that argument. <laughs> one recent magazine article noted that his critics have at various times called him sexist, racist, elitist, imperialist, bourgeois, a Neanderthal, a loose cannon, a motor mouth, Mr. Aggressive Steamroller, and my personal favorite, the Morton Downey of the Department of, Ener of Education. We at the Federalist Society, however, are proud to call Secretary Bennett a close friend. He was a speaker at one of our early meetings here in Washington, in fact, one of our best meetings. And although he may not remember, those of us who were founders of the society have fond memories of one of the early meetings with Secretary Bennett and Bill Kristol and other leading intellectuals in the conservative movement. We were just getting the Federalist Society started at that time and asked their advice for where we should go and what we should do. It's been implementing that advice that has brought the Federalist Society to where it is today. He told us, don't only talk to students, talk to lawyers and talk to academics. Take your ideas out of Washington, out into the heartland of America. So it's with those inspirational words that we've worked to make the Federalist Society a forum for the debate of intellectual ideas. And it's with warm hearts that we welcome him here tonight.
thank you, David, very much. I uh, appreciate those remarks. Um, one correction. Uh, I didn't say I had to be in bed early, but I said as I was wanted to be out of here at 9.30. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm a lot older than you are, but doesn't necessarily mean I'm going home to be in bed early. I just <laughs> said I wanted to be out of here at 9.30, and I'm, and I'm <clears throat> still going to do my best. I've got a busy day tomorrow. I'm uh, head coach for the Yellow Ninjas soccer team uh, group group of uh, seven-year-olds. We're playing the White Knights tomorrow at Stoddart uh, Field in Northwest at 11 o'clock. Yeah, good. <laughs> if the panels aren't everything they're supposed to be, just uh, come on out. It's good ball. Uh, the kids try hard. It's a work ethic. Uh, <laughs> we cut a lot of oranges up at halftime. We'll have some extras uh, for you. Um, well, I, what I wanted to do tonight is be a third person in the Epstein-Cutler debate, and you all remember where we are in that. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. Um, it's been a busy week, a long week uh, for me, and I imagine for many of you and for anybody who's been watching the hearings, uh, and I don't see any reason to go on at great, uh, at great length. Uh, also, uh, David was kind enough to put me on first and said the formal business follows later. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I knew you would not be pleased uh, to hear that. So I'm going to run through this uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it has been uh, an, a week we will remember. I have had a belly full uh, of uh, the hearing. Um, I don't know about you. Um, uh, not a belly full of law, I suppose. Uh, more like a belly full of politics. Or uh, what I decided it was this afternoon, jurisprudence light. Uh, <laughs> Law actually would have been okay uh, as uh, <laughs> in comparison to what we got, uh, even uh, natural law a little bit. Um, I think we can still say it in public. Uh, I hope we can. Um, <clears throat> that to which we are entitled by the laws of nature uh, and of nature's God. And that, that, <laughs> that, that part's not funny. That's, that's, that's the serious part. And that's the part right before the part that everybody knows. But it sort of leads in from there. And it would be interesting to say, well, that's sort of what I mean by natural law. Is there a problem uh, with the Declaration of Independence that the Senate would like to discuss here on television? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I, uh, I'm not a, a lawyer, um, so you all know a lot more about this than I do. But it seems to me if you were examining someone for the court, you want to look at their character, uh, that person's character and that person's temperament. And it would seem to me for the court, you would want to look at uh, that person's competence, um, their familiarity with the law. Uh, how learned are they? How conversant are they uh, with uh, the, the, the cases that have been decided? Do they know the cases? Do they know the history? Uh, and it struck me that very, very few questions were along those lines. Very, very few questions were, could you describe to us what happened in Dred Scott, and then what happened in Plessy versus Ferguson, and then what happened in Brown versus Board, what was the changing position of the court here. Rather, most of the questions struck me as, are you politically correct uh, or not? And that's a very different uh, kind, of, uh, kind of question. Again, you're all much more expert in these matters than I am, but it seems to me it's not too much of a jump to say that if the Senate begins to decide uh, on a ba on a, about a candidate based on their approval of his view as a judge, uh, then it seems to me they are starting to encroach and decide uh, what should be decided by a co-equal branch of government. And that seems to me to be a problem. But I'll leave that for you tomorrow. And uh, you can tell me at soccer game whether I have that, uh, whether I have that right. Um, as for Justice Thomas, he's a friend, and I think he's going to be confirmed. And I think that's uh, just terrific. I think he's a great guy. Uh, and I'm glad that he has not uh, seen uh, any obligation uh, to place his head uh, in the noose uh, by talking about things which he should not talk about. Uh, the notion that people just want to have a general and abstract discussion of things uh, without any reference to any particular decision would be belied the instant uh, he gave any indication of where he stood on these general and abstract things, at which point they would say exactly where that would lead in terms of a decision uh, and he would be finished. Uh, so I'm glad he's not fallen into that uh, trap. 
Um, it seems to me that um, he has many opportunities uh, left, and I hope he will take uh, some of them. Uh, and one of the opportunities he has uh, is to say, uh, without uh, saying uh, necessarily that the views of his uh, critics or interrogators are correct, that, um, that he has seen the American system of justice uh, from several perspectives. Uh, and one of them, uh, to paraphrase Harvey Mansfield, is a perspective from the bottom up. Uh, he's seen the American system of justice from underneath, uh, and that puts him in a very special and privileged position. Uh, he knows about these things from the bottom up, unlike many of the people who are asking him questions uh, who know about the bottom uh, only from copies of letters. They get faxed to them uh, from pressure groups and their summer uh, retreats. Uh, he, really, he really does know something uh, about uh, the things uh, which are, are indeed mere abstractions to many of his critics, uh, and that's worth saying. Uh, I think he'll be confirmed. I think he'll be a fine judge. I think we'll be proud of him. And yet, uh, at the end of the week, um, if someone were to ask me my feeling, my one sentiment, I guess my one sentiment and feeling or dominant one would be how much uh, I admire Bob Bork. Um, uh, Bob Bork had his version of uh, Here I Stand, I Can Do No Other. Uh, or, uh, and yet it moves, uh, Galileo, or Johnny Paychecks, take this job. Uh, um, and um, uh, Bob Bork um, um, is uh, very, very high in my estimation right now for uh, standing up for what he said and believed. And uh, they're both very good men. And those are my thoughts at the end of the week. But I'm supposed to talk to you about individual responsibility, and I will do so very briefly. Uh, individual responsibility in the law. Uh, I'll leave the law part to you um, for reasons that will be clear as I go through my remarks. Uh, you'll see that I don't know too much about the law, and it's, I will also confess, not something I regret uh, all, that, all that much. Uh, I, I think it's worth talking about individual responsibility without talking about individual responsibility in the law because I find individual responsibility, the individual responsibility part uh, of, the, uh, of the title uh, is like that uh, other title that I know pretty well, the Federalist, uh, often invoked but rarely uh, talked about, the Federalist often invoked but, uh, but rarely read. Uh, and individual responsibility is something people nod to but don't really talk about very much when they uh, uh, when they talk about topics like this. Um, <coughs> philosophers do, uh, and that's a good thing, but we need to have, I think, more of a public conversation about the notion of individual responsibility in which we do something more than just uh, nod in its direction. Um, philosophers, of course, do all sorts of things which may or may not be interesting to the public. I remember when I went to the American Philosophical Association meetings in Philadelphia because the theme that year was human rights, and I went to a six-hour session um, that began at uh, 3 in the afternoon on the topic, are there any uh, human rights? And the person who led off the session said, we'll spend the first four hours on the locution, are there any, uh, and the last hour or so on human rights. And we all went to see Bonnie and Clyde that night, I remember, <laughs> and got back in time for the rights part. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, uh, individual responsibility is, uh, is worth talking about. I'd like to say what I think it is, and I'd like to talk about it not from the books I read as a philosopher, but from some of my own experiences in individual responsibility. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot lately and been writing some about it, <clears throat> and wonder how it is that we make uh, the case uh, for individual responsibility, particularly how we make the case uh, to children uh, about individual responsibility. And it might just be worth a couple of minutes to review uh, how we go about doing that. Um, I am no paragon uh, of this particular virtue of individual responsibility. I, I think I'm pretty good as the world goes, not, not uh, great in this town, not bad at all, but, <laughs> but uh, outside the Beltway, pretty, pretty average. Um, but how did I learn it? I don't know. I think there are many influences. Uh, the earliest uh, 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 crash or shock or collision I had with the notion of individual responsibility 
uh, came, and I think probably the first one, the second one, the third one, maybe the first ten, uh, came uh, because of my training in the Catholic Church. I went to Catholic school, and they stressed that uh, a lot. Uh, that was a big, big deal, uh, and still is, and that's a good thing. I remember distinctly uh, coming home from school in Brooklyn, walking up Flatbush Avenue and going by Siegel's Delicatessen, where we often stopped uh, after school to get uh, um, a dill pickle or some french fries or maybe a hot dog. And I ordered a hot dog and realized it was Friday uh, afternoon. And um, the way we were taught then, you're not supposed to eat meat on Friday, and these were all beef. Uh, hot dogs, of course, at Seagulls. Um, <clears throat> what, what to do, and I decided um, I don't know why I decided it, but I decided, not knowing the phrase, I later heard the phrase, if you're going to sin, sin boldly. Um, I somehow knew it in my bones or in my belly, uh, this phrase. And when I realized it was Friday and the hot dog was coming, I said, give me three. Uh, and then I, uh, then I went to confession. And um, I was told this was wrong. And, uh, how sorry was I about this? Uh, was I truly penitent? Penance was the word then, not reconciliation. Uh, <laughs> penance was the word. And I tried to think about how sorry I really was. Um, and I wasn't hungry at the time I went to confession, so I wasn't that <laughs> sorry. But I, uh, there was an out, though, and it's a very important out uh, for, for human beings that the church has provided. It's called the distinction between perfect and imperfect contrition. Uh, perfect contrition means you're sorry for what you've done uh, because it has offended God, uh, and you don't want to do that. Um, he doesn't deserve that. Imperfect contrition is you're sorry because if you keep it up, you're going to burn in hell. And <laughs> I mustard at least, uh, mustard is not a joke here. I, uh, pun. I mustered at least uh, imperfect contrition. Uh, that's all I could do and went on. But I remember being scolded for it and I remember um, feeling that I wasn't sufficiently uh, penitent. So I told my mother about it and she said that I was overreaching. I, I'm sure that wasn't the word she used. Uh, over, overeating and overreaching, and and uh, it uh, it was an experience I'll, um, I won't uh, I won't forget. Uh, lots of experiences like that with the church, with lots of people telling me uh, and my classmates that what we were doing uh, were wrong uh, or was wrong. Now, some of the time, I think the experiences and situations and incidents they used. Uh, Maybe they weren't all, all that accurate. Uh, and certainly, I think there was a problem of distinguishing uh, between relatively unimportant and uh, relatively much more important things. But nevertheless, those were the rules. That was the code. And there were people there saying that some things were right and other things were wrong. Um, a second experience when I was in the Boy Scouts, the Boy Scouts um, in uh, New York, which is an odd experience in itself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not odd in the current way the Boy Scouts uh, experience may be odd, but in, in Brooklyn, being a Boy Scout is tough because merit badges are, are not geared. They're sort, of, they're sort of discrimination against kids in big cities for merit badges. A lot of these things have to do with not with things that are available and readily available in Brooklyn. Um, but subways, there's no merit badge for subways or for... <clears throat> hitting the interchange at Grand Central or something and, and <clears throat> identifying IRT, IND. <laughs> so, um, but we had a camping trip, which gave us all an opportunity uh, to get several merit badges you otherwise couldn't get. A camping trip in Brooklyn means you take the subway to the Dixie Terminal, and then you take a bus up to the Catskills, and you cross this six-lane highway and go up the hill and camp. Uh, <clears throat> pretty... Pretty, pretty sad, but, but we did it. We did it, and we were, we were armed uh, and ready, ready for nature, red in tooth and claw. And uh, we got up there, and we were supposed to start our fires and do all this, but um, we didn't do it. Several of us snuck down the back of the hill to Carvel's on the highway <laughs> and had dinner. You notice a lot of my experiences here have to do with eating. And <laughs> This is uh, the nature of man. Uh, we're, all, we're all flawed. We're flawed in different ways. Uh, this is the way I'm flawed. Anyway, the, the scoutmaster was furious and said that we were not being good scouts because we weren't doing what we were supposed to do. told us we were, uh, we were wrong. 
and uh, he was uh, he was right. We sort of frustrated and missed the point of the whole trip. Um, when I was at high school here in uh, Gonzaga High School in Washington, D.C., a very good high school, um, we used to practice um, <clears throat> at uh, on the Ellipse. And uh, when we played football, we had our football uh, team go down to the Ellipse. We had an old bus, and we drove down to the Ellipse. Uh, this was before they built the new field called Buchanan Field after a distinguished, truly distinguished graduate uh, of uh, Gonzaga, Buchanan's, many Buchanan's. And um, I uh, remember the humiliation uh, that I was uh, put through by uh, my coach um, who um, thought that I wasn't working hard enough. Coaches rarely do I think you're working hard enough and would make you run laps and do push-ups uh, where the tourists were uh, <clears throat> around the ellipse going to the Washington Monument. Again, uh, pretty tough stuff, but the lesson uh, from uh, my coach was uh, clear enough uh, that uh, I wasn't doing my job. Uh, I wasn't doing what I had signed on to do, and I remember him uh, telling me uh, pretty distinctly and pretty clearly uh, as the scoutmaster, as the church, as my parents, that what I was doing uh, was wrong. Williams College, um, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, <clears throat> my junior year, one of my fraternity brothers uh, got uh, so drunk he couldn't move uh, in the morning. Uh, he was on disciplinary probation at Williams, which meant if you cut a class when you were on disciplinary probation, you would be thrown out of the school. So uh, we carried him uh, to class. <laughs> and um, it was a seminar, Professor Org. <laughs> Some of you may experience this tomorrow, or some, some likeness to this. But uh, we carried uh, Dick to, to class, to the seminar, and sat him there. Uh, and um, the professor marked him absent. And <laughs> that's, when, that's when one of my teachers identified me as having an instinct for law school. Because I said, <clears throat> I said no, he's present. Um, <laughs> How can you say he's absent? That sort of cleverness that uh, makes people say you should go to law school. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, dean, the dean, the dean at Williams called us in and said, bad stunt, uh, bad behavior. You guys shouldn't be doing this anyway. You guys shouldn't be wrecking your college careers like this. And it was very cute, and it was a nice act of self-defense or defense of, uh, of a friend and a classmate, but uh, it doesn't work and um, um, what you did was wrong. Um, those are all, I know, pretty uh, severe examples and pretty serious examples, but this, this message uh, was sort of coming across over a period of time uh, for me. I should end with a law school experience. I was at Harvard, because I promised I'd explain to you why I don't know much about the law, and after my first year at law school, <clears throat> maybe I already have explained to you, all right. After my first year, I, st I took my course list in to my advisor for my second year courses. And my advisor was a tax professor named Andrews. I think it was Andrews. Andrews wore a bow tie. Does anybody remember? Is that Andrews? OK. All tax professors wear bow ties. Thank you. And my courses were legal history, uh, jurisprudence, two jurisprudence courses, comparative law, uh, Russian law, uh, and uh, law and ethics. And he said, what is this? <laughs> and I said, it's a program of study at the Harvard Law School and for second year students. And he said, you can't be anything with uh, this kind of a program. And I said, I don't want to be anything. I, I, I said, I, I'm working on my PhD in philosophy, and I'm interested in jurisprudence. And I want to I wanna study this. And he said, um, I don't think I can sign this. I mean. There's nothing on this list. There's, there's no corporations. There's no, what do you take, second year tax. There's no commercial transactions. Uh, there's no uh, deconstructive. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> I'm making that up. Anyway, he said, go back and think about this, which was a very nice thing for him to do, because I really did have to go back and think about it and realize that I was at one of, supposedly, one of the great law schools in America, blowing my chances. Uh, to be a uh, lawyer in the way that uh, many people there were going to be lawyers. And I had to think about uh, what I wanted to be uh, when I grew up and whether I really wanted to take this course of study. And I decided, uh, yeah, I did. And I went back to see him and he said, I think it's wrong. There was that word again. Uh, and I said, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Now at that point, those of you who are jurisprudes, um, 
I said jurisprudence. I don't want anybody <laughs> to misunderstand what I said. Um, <clears throat> understand that I shifted from talking about the morality of obligation to the morality of aspiration. Um, <clears throat> I started to talk and think, at least in this context, about not just what I was obligated to do as a member of society, or as a Catholic, or as a Boy Scout, uh, or as uh, uh, an undergraduate, as a student, but what I wanted to do uh, and be uh, when I was grown up in terms of my goals, in terms of my aims. But still, uh, there was someone there uh, in my life uh, giving me some guidance uh, and judgment about it. The reason I bring uh, all this up um, is not to be tedious, uh, I hope, and not to go on too long, but to say that it seemed to me, uh, however it turns out, it was extremely helpful for me along the way uh, to have had a, a lot of people lined up at various stations of my life uh, saying certain things um, <clears throat> to me uh, about my behavior, about my actions, about the steps I was taking. People who were even honest enough and candid enough to say, what you did here was wrong. Uh, you violated the rules. This isn't right. Uh, get, back on, uh, get back on track. Robert Coles, um, in his study of the Girl Scouts, um, a study that he did with several other people, uh, points out uh, that one of the biggest problems with kids these days is that nobody is giving them any guidance uh, whatsoever. Uh, nobody is telling them this is right or this is wrong. Uh, there's a lot of uh, congratulatory stuff going on, uh, but there's not a lot of straight uh, speaking uh, about things. I know the difficulties of laying it on uh, too heavy and laying it on too thick uh, and coming on uh, with too... Uh, uh, to uh, um, tough a view of the world. Uh, nevertheless, I think, and uh, it was interesting to read this review in this book by Coles, uh, that he thinks uh, we need more uh, such uh, stating of um, um, uh, a candid statement of responsibility on the part of adults, uh, not less. In one section of the book, um, and I leave this to you to think about, Coles says that one thing he's very worried about uh, is the uh, use uh, in the schools uh, of what's called self-esteem and the emphasis on self-esteem. Uh, he worries uh, that too much emphasis on self-esteem uh, might lead students uh, not to have an appropriate degree uh, of guilt uh, or uh, regret about actions they have taken. Uh, well, uh, I would hope that we could strike a path uh, which is neither um, uh, dumbly or naively um, um, uh, uh, caricatured in this self-esteem uh, uh, kind of prototype, at the same time one uh, that isn't, uh, makes the child so guilt-ridden uh, that the child uh, is no longer able to function. When you look around uh, at things uh, like facts uh, in the world and see the condition uh, of many of our young people, I think it is fair to say that the problem, um, the shortage right now, uh, and this suggests to us where we ought to shift our weight uh, is toward uh, saying uh, those things again. Uh, saying them with love, saying them with understanding, saying them with patience, uh, but saying them uh, again. Um, if we just nod in the direction of individual responsibility, uh, but do not teach it, uh, do not take the trouble of taking a stand for it uh, daily uh, in schools uh, and uh, in playgrounds and in soccer games, and in other places, it seems to me then uh, we cannot uh, complain uh, that um, things are going badly, um, but uh, nobody seems to be doing anything about it. Um, if there are false bids for government securities or lousy investments on the part of savings and loans, uh, or people deciding to spend their time knocking out crack, uh, or people fathering children but not fathering to them, uh, perhaps uh, where our attention and energies uh, have to go um, is in uh, standing at these various stations uh, saying these things along the way. Again, uh, saying them with patience, saying them with tolerance and understanding, uh, but nevertheless saying them uh, as Learned Hand uh, said, or to paraphrase Learned Hand, uh, so that we do not have a society so riven uh, that the courts uh, and the laws uh, cannot save. Uh, it seems to me that, as Holmes said, uh, the solution uh, to most of our problems is for us to grow more civilized. And the way we grow more civilized is by remembering uh, those steps we have to take uh, along the way. Um, <clears throat> if we don't take the steps uh, and stand at the stations, it's possible uh, that uh, no one will. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.